beautiful, right? Truth, like maybe a little unbelievable truth. The bridegroom, the bride, it's just, it's so, it's a mystery um, that the call the Lord calls us to enter into, invites us to enter into. And I don't know about you guys, but I would say my everyday reality is not always reflective of that. And so I want to talk a little bit now about why, what gets in our way. Um, and I want to start with a, this quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, there is no neutral ground in all the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Oh yeah, there it is, right? The, the clash, the push-pull, right? Um, that C.S. Lewis describes so beautifully. The push-pull of the spiritual reality in which we find ourselves. Um, Jesus also talks about this push-pull in many places throughout scriptures. And I want to read to you a verse from John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus tells us, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that you may have life and have it abundantly. So Jesus tells us, that verse comes within the context of the Good Shepherd narrative. So Jesus is telling us, we have a Good Shepherd, and that is him. Jesus himself is our Good Shepherd, and his will for us, his deep desire for us, is abundant life, overflowing abundance. He wants us to be fully alive. Um, and then he tells us there's a thief who just wants to steal that from us. And so um, I want to talk about that for a minute because I think it's really important. We're not to overly focus on the thief, but it's important to know who he is and how he operates. So you know God has a plan for our lives, and his plan is freedom, to live in freedom. And the enemy's plan is to separate us from that, to keep us from experiencing the free, abundant life that the Lord has planned for us. His plan is to basically separate us from God's love, um, to tell us that maybe we're not worthy of that kind of love, or that we haven't done enough to earn that love yet. So we're going to talk about some of the lies that we tend to believe that keep us not living in that space that Megan was describing, but more of a space of you know desolation, I'll call it, anxiety, worry, fear. Okay, so um, the word Satan, we're going to talk about him for a minute, it literally means accuser. In Hebrew, it means accuser, to denounce as an adversary. We also know in Scripture, Jesus tells us he is a liar, the father of lies, he's a deceiver. Again, in John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus says, He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So we know we sometimes say, I uh, hear the term the enemy. The enemy refers not to just one being, not just to Satan, but to his legions of fallen angels. And a priest named John Harden has described it this way. The devil is not one being. The devil is an organized battalion of malice, a mystical body of Satan on earth to oppose the mystical body of Christ, which is us, the church, right? Okay, um, last thing I want to say about him, you know, he's pure angelic spirit, right? He's a created being, created an angel. And the catechism tells us about the fallen angels. The word angel means messenger, an indication of their function. They bring us messages. Their nature is spirit, not limited by a body. Now, because the gifts and call of God are irrevocable, the fallen angels retain these created abilities, but use them against us rather than to help us. And so in their malice, they will tend to deceive and try to separate us from God until the end of time, right? Um, and the most opportune time to tempt us is in a moment of pain, a moment of weakness. And I want to talk to you for a moment about um, a moment of weakness in my life. I once had one. <laughs> it lasted for about 15 years or so. But um, yeah, so I'm going to use a little bit of my story to illustrate how we, you know, how we start to believe the, the deceptions that just seem you know, so true and so real. It's like all we know. So um, I want to give you a little snapshot of this moment in my life. Uh, the this, this snapshot it was probably the summer of like 1997. And uh, my mom, who's here today, do you want to be, not remain anonymous, that's Helen. Hi, Mom. So my mom, around this time, was diagnosed with, with Lyme disease. Well, actually, it went undiagnosed for a really long time, because I don't think anyone was looking for Lyme disease back then. 
Um, she had all kinds of crazy health symptoms. She, her vision went for a little time, and then she could see again. And she, her hand, she couldn't use her hands. And it was really scary. And also in that time, she got, was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and somewhere in there, her and my dad got divorced. And so my mom left her job to care for her health. She had been the vice president of human resources for a French company and was, had traveled all over Europe and the United States and was very you know, independent and taking care of herself. And all of a sudden, it was like I had this whole new mom who was very sick and needy. And I did not know how to relate with her at all. Um, I didn't know how to relate to her and her illness because I just wanted it to go away. And so there was some fear that crept in. Um, the Lord knows how stubborn I am, so he had to keep piling situations on. on. So my older sister, who many of you have met because she facilitates healing retreats with me, and um, she, the Lord has done beautiful healing work in her life, but in this time in, in our lives, she was um, really struggling with the effects of early abuse in her childhood and also being in an abusive marriage for a very long time. And I didn't know any of this at the time. All I knew was that my sister was extremely depressed suicidal at times, diagnosed with eating disorder, bipolar, you know, every, everything, mental illness we could think of. Um, and I, I was scared. Now, she lives in Ohio, and I live in Pennsylvania, and that distance became like my safety net. I didn't have to actually like see what was happening over there. Um, and really, I didn't have to face my fear and how helpless I felt to do anything to help her. Um, our little sister, Jen, was... That summer, she was hospitalized. We were out to breakfast one day, and the whites of her eyes were yellow. Like, the, well, maybe not quite as bright as the painting on the wall back there, but pretty darn yellow. And I said, Jen, you've got to go to the doctor. And she went to our family doctor, who sent her to Chester County Hospital, who sent her to CHOP, where she stayed for about 40 days um, with what turned out to be a rare blood disease. And her, her body was attacking her own white blood cells. And she, like, basically, she was dying from the inside out. And it was very scary. And the treatment for it was really awful. Uh, but she's doing well. She's, she recovered, and she's doing well. But that was um, really scary. And I made a lot of ultimatums. I gave the Lord a lot of ultimatums during that time. I was growing angrier. Um, the one last situation was that another one of our siblings um, was a heroin addict from the time he was probably about 15 or 16 years old. And... Um, through the time in the addiction, you know, there was a lot of damage that was done, as you can imagine, to our family. And, and to me personally, we were very close, and I was dealing with a lot of betrayal from him. Um, and that summer, things kind of came to a head, and um, there, he spent some time in jail, and it was, you know, the Lord was, like, trying really hard to get my attention. Um, and I was getting really caught in the fear and the hopelessness. Um, and looking around at my life going, what just happened? You know, here I am, clean, healthy, sober, and just scared to death, you know? And um, the foundation of what, everything I knew was just had imploded. And in that moment, I heard this voice in my head that said, you could do something. You could fix this. And I thought, yes, if I could just say the right things, if I could do the right things and find the right solutions, I could fix this. I could control what's happening with my family. Yeah. <laughs> Only that actually did not work. Um, I was more than a little angry and, um, you know, discovering that I actually can't control and my grasping for control was just making things worse in our, in our relationships. Um, and so the enemy piled on the accusations. You're not strong enough for this. What's wrong with you? You should be able to figure this out. You know, anyone else, they would know what to do. And the words felt so true, and the voice sounded like my own voice. And so I believed it. I believed him. And uh, I got really caught, you know, weighed down by this pack of lies, which came with a, a lot of emotions that I didn't deal with, at least not skillfully. Uh, grief, anger, rage. Um, fear, guilt, shame, you know, and just kind of stuffed it all, which created this inner dialogue that was filled with judgment, filled with self-criticism. Um, what I came to learn was filled with lies, 
quite frankly. So again, you know, using that time in my life, the enemy to to recall those, and Jen's going to talk to us after the break about Unbound, that became a, a major open door to the influence of the evil one in my life. Um, and that door opened, though, by my invitation when I said, yes, you're right. I want to fix this. I'm going to control this. I'm going to figure this out. So what happened over time was that you're not strong enough for this just became a general you're not enough, period. That you should be doing something was like my theme song. You know, I was ensnared by the lie that I could not say no and that I was responsible, like, basically for everything. Um, and underlying all that, again, was that agreement that I had made. Listen to that, those words. The agreement that I made with Satan. It's like, what? You made an agreement with Satan? Well, in effect, yes, right? When he accuses and I agree to the accusation, I'm saying, yes, I, I sh there's something wrong with me, you know? Everyone else would know what to do. Now, I know that many of you can relate to this. Maybe not the particulars, but we all have a story. We all get ensnared by lies and we become weighed down. And the beautiful thing is that's not the end of the story. We're never stuck there. Um, our Lord so deeply, deeply desires our freedom and has given us um, everything we need to get there. And one in particularly powerful tool that Jen will talk to us after the break is the five keys of unbound. Um, but what I want to what I want to say here is that you know it's really important to begin to discern. So that verse that I mentioned, John chapter ten, verse ten where we learn that we have a good shepherd whose will for us is life, and we learn that we have a, a thief whose will for us is not life, right, desolation. So we can use that verse as a little bit of a discernment tool, you know, when I'm feeling that powerlessness feeling, that helpless, the fear, and I want to start grasping, I, I can know immediately that is not the voice of my shepherd. My shepherd's will for me is life, right? And we can start to discern and separate the voices. And that's what we're really going to be doing throughout the rest of the day today. We'll be learning more uh, tools. You know, Father will talk to us after lunch about one of our amazing tools that Megan touched on a lot too, and that is our Blessed Mother. Um, Father's breakout later on intercessory prayer when he'll tell, talk to us about you know, how we can lean into the angels and the saints. So, so we're not alone in this battle. We have so many powerful tools. Um, so we're going to spend the rest of the day talking about that. But one thing I want to say here that's really important, I named some of the lies that I believed, and I, I would take a guess that some of you also have experienced or maybe are experiencing believing those same lies. What's wrong with me? You know, why can't I figure this out? Everybody else would know what to do. I mean, your lives just work all the time, right? I mean, look at your Facebook pages. <laughs> Everything's good, right? No, it's not. Neither is mine. You know, I said this to my mom recently. We, we went on a family vacation last summer, and um, like literally, it was one of those weeks where my husband and I could agree on nothing, and we didn't take a single picture together the whole time. And so we're literally waiting outside of a. Of my daughter was shopping in, a, in a, like a you know store, buying a T-shirt or something. And there was two Adirondack chairs, and I'm like, sit down. So we sat in the Adirondack chair. I'm like, smile. I mean, I took a selfie. Like, That's the picture I put on my Facebook page. <laughs> you always have to see the real stuff, right? So we, we just have to know that. You know, we, the stuff that's wrong in my life is not all that different than the stuff that's wrong in your life. And this is one of the most insidious lies of the enemy is to tell you, you are the only one who's experiencing this. Everybody else has it all figured out. There is something wrong with you. I, I, I hate that line, but I, I've said it like two or three times now because I can't tell you how often when I'm praying with people that comes up. And, it, and we, we believe it, but we need to stop believing it. There's nothing wrong with you, right? Um, and so that's probably his greatest lie, is that you're all alone. Nobody else could understand what you're dealing with. And, and what happens is we get, we get sucked into this toxic emotion called shame, right? And, and that keeps us uh, quiet, keeps us wanting to isolate ourselves and hide. And yeah, that is not life. Does that sound like the voice of our shepherd? No. 
You know, the voice of our shepherd says, you are my beloved. There is no shame in you. You know, I came that you may have life and have it to the full. So we're not stuck there, right? We have tools. We have our shepherd who says to us, I have something so much more for you. But as Megan, maybe this was Father in his homily, he mentioned how Jesus is such a gentleman. He's such a gentleman and so um, considerate of our free will that even our freedom is not going to be forced on us. He waits for us to take a hold of it. He invites us into it and waits for us to say yes. And so that's what these five keys are. They're five ways that we use our free will to say yes. Yes to the plan of God and no to the plan of the enemy. 